Welcome back to CIBC Presents Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, before we get into tonight's lecture, a uh, couple of things to talk about. This is the last lecture for this year. Um, there will be uh, nothing next Wednesday. Uh, and then the following Wednesday, May the 5th, will be the Upstart competition. You are all invited to the Upstart competition. Um, it will be held in this room. Um, and uh, I'll remind you, you will need to sign an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, in order to protect the IP of, of all of the presenters. At the end of that competition, which ends about five o'clock or so, uh, the party starts and we'll have the room divided into, I don't know, I don't know how much we have for the presentations in the party or vice versa, but there will be a split and the party will be held in the back half. And obviously, you're all welcome and you don't have to sign an NDA to get into that. If you're looking for your certificate, uh, they will be handed out to all those who are eligible uh, at, that, uh, at that party. You'll get uh, an email blast next week that has the usual uh, link to slides from tonight, etc. And you will get a reminder on the, the following Monday or Tuesday about the upstart. So, um, we do have one other announcement um, before we get into tonight's lecture, and I'm going to ask my colleague, Cynthia Goh, who was the founder of uh, the whole concept of Entrepreneurship 101. Uh, Cynthia's got another gig going, and I'm going to uh, invite her up here to tell you a little bit uh, about that. And I think I can get the... There we go. Well, uh, thank you, Tony, for giving me a couple minutes to actually introduce uh, my new uh, venture. Uh, yeah, Tony and I started uh, Entrepreneurship 101 um, as something to teach the students of U of T about how to take all the wonderful science they do in the lab and turn it into something that is of closer benefit to society. And I'm glad to see that Entrepreneurship 101 has grown. It's now beyond the boundaries of U of T. It's not just students, it's everyone. Uh, but it's, for me, it's not a startup any longer, so I am ready to do my new startup, which is uh, venture number two, Technopreneurship 2010. And this is directed primarily to students or recent graduates, people who probably have not much experience uh, uh, about, uh, of entrepreneurship. And what we are basically doing here is spend the month of July, uh, two days, Wednesday and Saturday, some nights, to actually work on building the company to focus uh, the efforts of the student into having that company plan um, made ready to go. So um, the important thing, uh, just the website and the email, uh, we will be accepting applicants. Um, I think we will limit ourselves to probably 10 teams only. Each team can be two to five people. We have limited space because uh, unlike a uh, a course, this is not a course, there will be some lectures, there'll be some uh, workshops, some networking, but it's primarily teaching the way uh, science is taught to students. Basically, you have a project, you go work at it with all the technology and business advisors on hand. So anyway, um, I just please uh, take a look at our website. I think it's going up sometime today or tomorrow. Uh, if you're interested, uh, do not send me email, but send email to events at optics.utoronto.ca. So thank you. And we will include uh, this link in the uh, email blast that goes out next Monday. So, tonight's lecture, uh, Building an Effective Pitch. Uh, there is an alternative title for that, but I'm going to let tonight's uh, speaker uh, share that with you. Tonight's speaker is James Smith, uh, Vice President of, Health, of the Healthcare and Clean Tech Group at Equicom. And I'll let James tell you a little bit about Equicom. Uh, his background, uh, you know I have a fondness for chemists, so he started with a bachelor's degree in engineering uh, chemistry, 
and then moved to a master's in biochemical engineering uh, from Queens. Um, and as we were chatting, he, I guess he divides his earlier uh, careers into 10 years in science and then 10 years in capital, um, which is um, kind of oil and vinegar. Um, uh, so maybe he's the, uh, you know, the solubility agent that helps uh, mix those. But he, um, he built a cell culture lab in, at a research institute in Northern Europe. Uh, he started a private analytical lab in Vancouver, and he's run grassroots engineering uh, development projects in the third world. And then moving on, he's provided consulting services uh, to a venture capital firm, and that's both evaluating new investment opportunities and then working closely with the, those chosen to become investee companies. Um, he then um, joined Equicom in 2001, and there um, he provides strategic insight to innovative companies uh, by leveraging that combination of financial industry and hands-on experience. So I'm going to turn it over to James uh, to talk about building an effective pitch. And I hope the upstart competitors are here. You should pay attention. Thank you, Tony. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is James Smith, and I uh, as Tony mentioned, I'm with the Equicom Group. I've been there for the last nine years. Uh, my life prior to that was more of a scientist. Uh, graduated about uh, 1992 from uh, an engineering degree. And then similar times to what we're experiencing now came out of that. Really not a lot of opportunities in 1992. And it became, uh, you know, what do you do at that point? Obviously, uh, I loved the academic side, so it wasn't too hard for me to go right back in and continue to do academics. Um, but that was a really great time uh, in, in the world and in North America because there wasn't a lot of capital available and, and, and there was this recession going on. And that really, to me, is one of the key drivers of entrepreneurship is when, you know, it, it sounds harsh and brutal, but when people are out there and they're looking to, for new opportunities, they can't find opportunities that are readily available, they go out, they seize capital, they try to make it happen on their own. And that's really what drives, that's the engine of our economy. So uh, much like uh, a lot of uh, other people at that time, went out, started to find my own ways to, to, to bring money in the door and to feed myself, uh, went out to BC. There was a fish war going on between uh, BC and, uh, and the US. So it was an opportunity to do some, uh, at that time it was protein analysis to see the difference between the fish. You could tell where they had spawned. You could negotiate your treaties. And the U.S. had lots of money to put into that kind of technology. Canada didn't, but the U.S. was, they wanted the, 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 the treaties, so they were willing to fund an entrepreneur who was willing to bring up the Canadian side of that expertise. So that was a great opportunity. Um, went on to uh, do some entre other entrepreneurial things, but uh, was really focused on cell culture and, and enjoyed that side of the science. Went to Denmark, did a lot of more scientific work on the cell culture side, worked with physicians on sort of artificial stomach type work, to sort of use a generic term for it. And then uh, at that time came back in 2000, and again, a lot of opportunity here. The next bubble was forming, and uh, everyone was putting capital. It was kind of the reverse situation now. Lots of capital available, lots of ideas to be funded. No one knew what was the right idea to put money into, so they needed some people with scientific expertise who could say, this is magic beans, this isn't. Uh, I don't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily any much better than anybody else without a science background of doing that, but it was, uh, it was the right place at the right time kind of thing. And from there, it's been a great experience at Equicom where basically uh, people in my company, if you're, if you're doing a position like mine, you get to see uh, hundreds of different companies. You get to see every fund manager who invests in those type of companies, the analysts, the bankers that help to make those companies grow. And so you get a really great opportunity to see the entire industry from all perspectives. So I've really enjoyed my time at Equicom over the last nine years or so in, in that perspective. But uh, fundamentally, my background and also what we do at Equicom are, are work well together in the sense that it is bridging that oil and, and vinegar with, uh, it's called a co-solvent. I've learned from uh, working with Biox, uh, a company making uh, biodiesel. But uh, um, bringing those two elements together is pretty challenging. and it, uh, 
it takes, it takes some effort to, to bridge that gap. And there's a lot of time that people with scientific backgrounds can waste trying to get across things that people who have the money don't really care about. And meanwhile, there's a lot of things that scientific people, people working on the ideas have a lot of important points they need to make to the people with money in order to get that money, and they're not necessarily achieving that. So um, my goal today is to sort of in this brief period of time we have is try to give you some of the basic points, some of the sort of low-hanging fruit of what we do at Equicom, in, uh, specifically in the vehicle of, of presentations that might help you going forward with when you're trying to get your ideas across, pitch your, your business, and maybe try to win some money over to some investment to, to take your ideas forward. Okay? So, I guess I can move forward here. Uh, so, again, my name is James Smith, and uh, I gave you a bit of my background. Uh, again, why do, we, why do we do it? Why do we sort of bang our heads against the wall trying to move these, uh, these uh, you know, amazing scientific ideas forward, but they are you know, sometimes pretty radical ideas, pretty hard for people to get their heads around to believe in. You know, so why do we pursue these? Um, you know, and this could, this is a stock chart, but this could also reflect sort of my masters in a way, where, <laughs> you know, I spent uh, two years trying to grow uh, um, animal cells, trying to grow uh, stomach cells and trying to grow insect cells. And uh, at one point down the hall, someone started, decided, decided that they could start to growing fungus and seeing what that would be like. And uh, sure enough, in my tea flasks, I could show him the fungus that he was growing. It was growing really well. So, uh, so quite often, you know, you go along these, uh, these points where you work really hard, you're trying to get to success, and it can come down to a binary event, and, and uh, everything is pretty much uh, down to a new level, and you find yourself uh, starting over. So uh, I think the point I'm trying to make here is we all know uh, when you're working with life, uh, you don't necessarily have all the control, um, and there's a lot of disappointments, there's a lot of frustrations, and it requires a lot of hard work. Just another example of, even though you think you're making progress, binary event happens, you're back to, to zero. But it doesn't matter because we're all passionate. I love entrepreneurs. I've done a lot of work with entrepreneurs over the years, uh, worked in some uh, advocacy groups around entrepreneurship. I've supported... Uh, different entrepreneurs. Uh, I've worked for free doing some of this stuff to help people out. And uh, I love life sciences. I don't think there's any more powerful uh, area of technology for you know, affecting the world and improving some of the situations we have, uh, making life better. So it's, it's, just, it's such a powerful area of technology. This is so, and we're just at the, at the uh, early stages now. Um, and then I love Canada. I think this is a great country. Um, I don't know if you've my, my colleague, Mike Polanski, who was actually slated to give this talk, and uh, some of these are his slides, so I'm sort of repeating some of the things he says in that point, but I love Canada as much as he loves Canada. The point we make about it is there's a lot of great innovation going on here. We're, you know, we're great people, we work hard, and we're nice people too. And uh, I think you know, that combination makes it a, a great uh, dynamic for, for pushing forward. Uh, but this is why investors like uh, this area, right? Because when things do go right, uh, they can go right in a big way and, uh, and make people lots of money and, and really make a, a dramatic change in the way things are done. So you have to remember that when you're trying to communicate to the people that have the money that this is really what they care about. And they don't necessarily care that you were able to do something that no one else has been able to do before and it's really cool um, you know, it goes ping, whatever it does, it's not, it's not the same as, as making money. And so, um, one thing that I think is important for everyone to understand when you're, when you're moving your ideas forward, moving your business forward, is that it's not about uh, a stock price that constantly grows. And stock prices is, is what applies to public companies that are out there in the stock market. But whether you're a public company or a private company or an individual moving forward with an idea, uh, I'm sure a lot of you, uh, you know, are working on sort of a model of where you see yourself going, where you see your idea going, and you see it as constantly improving, constantly evolving, getting better, and it gets more and more valuable over time. Just like, you know, most of you, if you're a salary paid person, you expect that you should get consistent raises over your life. 
And that's not really how this sector operates. The way this sector operates is, again, you're trying to get to those binary events. And the only way to get to those binary events is to have enough cash to do the work you need to do to get to those binary events. And if you don't have that cash to get there, it doesn't matter how much improvement you're making incrementally, how much more value you're adding, because at the end of the day, if you can't get to that binary event, it's game over, right? So you really have to focus on survival and cash, right? Uh, another, another way to illustrate how critical this is is when you look at the way companies have funded themselves over the, uh, over the last 20 years or so. So if you take the bigger companies that are ready to go into IPOs, there's really been a limited number of opportunities for companies to go into IPOs in this sector, in the healthcare sector. Um, you know, when in, the, in the early 90s, there was a wave of product approvals, you know, sort of that first wave of, of, uh, of products coming out of the biotech boom, and, and that drove an IPO window. Uh, 95, arguably, there was a window again. We all know the 2000 window where the tech bubble, a lot of cash being generated by the tech bubble, a lot of it on the table. So uh, investors who had made money in tech were now looking around saying, where can I make more money? Where can I deploy some of this capital I've just made? Let's plug it into biotech. And at the same time, you had Bill Clinton talking about you know, the Human Genome Project was finished. And uh, it was just a, a nice, perfect storm of events to create that window for IPOs. And a lot of our public companies, the ones that are still alive today, a lot of them were generated around that time. Uh, we had another trickle through of IPOs in the mid-2000s, but really there's not been a, a window you know, even close in comparison to what happened in 2000. And so we've really struggled over the last decade to get companies through the whole spectrum to where they can become public. And, uh, you know, and, and if you think about the average product and where you're trying to get to, you're ultimately going to need that public money in order to do your larger trials and, and really reap your big rewards. So from the company's perspective, what's keeping this window closed, or what's frustrating for everybody, valuations are low, and they can't raise the money they need. Um, so it's frustrating from the company's perspective. And from the investor's perspective, uh, they're frustrated about IPOs because the IPOs that have come out since 2000 haven't really performed that well. They tend to come out and go down, actually, after they've IPO'd. And so it's been frustrating for investors. So we kind of have this situation where you know, no one's happy and nothing's getting done. Uh, and then on the flip side, sort of give you a, a bit of insight into what I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, investors who do finally come into these companies and put their money behind them, and, uh, and, and you know, whether it's giving $10 million to a public company and waiting for data or giving you know, $10,000 to a very early stage entrepreneur to do something, they get confused by what their expectations are right out of the bat. So I've given you money today and within six months I'm asking you, why do you need more money now? You know, wasn't what I gave you enough to get to the end? Uh, why, why aren't you increasing in value every day like we talked about? Um, why, why is that company down the States worth three times as much as you are? Um, and why aren't you out there, you know, getting the stock price up? Why aren't you just somehow waving a magic wand and getting more value out of this? And, and lots of questions like that. So again, that, that sort of shows what happens when you try to mix oil and water, oil and vinegar together, is you get this kind of frustration. It's a real problem out there. And so I think you know, one of the goals today is to try to get you not to create or perpetuate more of that frustration in what you do when you communicate, when you go out to seek money. So, Ultimately, communications matter is, is the fundamental point here. The, uh, when you buy a, a computer nowadays, you pretty much always uh, get Office. Even when you're buying a Mac now, pretty much everyone is getting Office these days. And when you buy Microsoft Office, you get Word, you get Excel. Uh, Word, everyone knows how to write, it, write uh, I would hope. You know? and, and Excel, I think, you know, in this room, certainly, I think everyone uh, enjoys what a spreadsheet can do. But you also get a software program called PowerPoint. And, uh, and PowerPoint is, is probably more complex than Excel or, uh, or Word. Um, you know, I mean, argue about Excel, but I think PowerPoint is a lot more complexity to it. And yet everyone, when they open up the computer, get on there, they start making PowerPoints right from day one. Like it's no problem to make a PowerPoint and, uh, and go off. And, 
And to me, one of the analogies I like to use is, uh, you know, musical instruments, uh, bass guitar. I play bass guitar in a band. Uh, bass guitar is one of the easiest instruments in the world probably to pick up and, and sound like you can do something within a couple of hours. But to sound really good, or which I don't, but to sound decent takes years and years and years of practice. I've been playing bass for 20 years, and I'm, even now when I pick it up, I'm sort of, why couldn't I do that last year? It sounds so much better. Um, you wouldn't go out you know, picking up a violin or a bass guitar or whatever, and you wouldn't go around and start saying, I'm going to go give concerts to everybody. I'm going I'm to play you, you know, let me play you a tune now. Let me play you a tune now. You'd be hurting everyone's ears all the time. You'd be, you know, presenting, you'd be giving a performance that you're not ready to give. And that's really what I see happening with PowerPoints out there. People get their new Mac, they get the Office pre-installed, they open it up, and right away they start generating PowerPoints. And they go out there and they present them, and then they're frustrated, you know, where's my money? Where's, why aren't you thrilled with my idea? Where's my standing ovation? Um, it's not that easy. It takes work. Uh, this is, again, a slide that uh, we, we talk about quite often, that one of Mike's uh, favorite ones, but I kept it in because I like uh, giving this analogy as well, or this, this story as well. Uh, does anyone know who wrote that? So the, the person who wrote that, and this is someone who uses PowerPoint pretty much on a daily basis, works on it meticulously to communicate the strategies that they feel they need to communicate and they're taking on one of the biggest uh, endeavors ever, uh, and they're, they're using PowerPoint every day uh, as one of their key and most effective tools for, for managing what they're doing. And that was General Proteus uh, on PowerPoint. So you know, regardless of your political leanings or, or your feelings on war or all that, the, the point I'm trying to make here is, you know, here's a guy who's got an incredible amount of uh, both logistics and he's got to win over hearts and minds, win over uh, people on concepts, and he's saying PowerPoint is the most important tool for him. Uh, he didn't have PowerPoint. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't quite perfected by the time he was around, but uh, again, it, it conveys the idea of how important effective communications are. So when you look at uh, the situation you know, around 1940 here, where things were not looking good at all, uh, if you were uh, if you were uh, in this country and uh, you were starting to get pretty concerned about how things were going to end up, it was time to really get out there and motivate everybody and, and bring the hearts and minds back around. Uh, it wasn't done with, you know, here's my 40 page or 100 page business plan on how we're going to win this war, how we're going to change things. It wasn't done with you know, a four-hour lecture series on it or a panel of experts or anything. It was done with a 45-minute speech, right? And that's, that's critical to understand that, you know, you can, you can command such attention and get such an effect with, with so, uh, so minimal, um, I want to say an effort, because it's still a monumental effort, but with so minimal uh, amount of communication. And, and that's key to remember. You don't need to say everything, you just need to say the right thing. So uh, flip through that PowerPoint, that slide pretty quickly there, and uh, we'll make this the interactive portion of the, uh, of the talk. So if I could have uh, sort of everyone just chime up here. Uh, does everyone remember, does anyone uh, remember what the uh, picture on the left side, on my side of that uh, slide was? Just yell out what what was there? Go ahead. Speak up, speak up. A girl? Small girl? Okay. Um, what color was her hair? Blonde? And was she 20, 15, 5, 8? Okay. Um, was she standing, sitting, sitting? Was she angry? Was she happy? Smiling? Uh, what was on the other side of the uh, picture? Text? Cell phone? You know what kind of cell phone it was? Yeah. Um, you know, that, that, that speaks to it right there. I mean, you know, you, we managed to convey a lot of rich information without any words on the picture on the right. There's a ton of information on the picture on the left. 
and, uh, and really we got nothing out of it in that brief period of time. In a microsecond, ton of information transferred on the picture on the right. So what is a presentation? You know, and, and taking that lesson we just learned now, I, I would argue with you, you know, people say, is it, does it need to be specific? When I'm going out to present, how specific should I be? Or should I just be general and, and give an overall view? I think, you know, you've got to remember your objective when you go in to pitch for money. Your objective is to get them to invest in you, to leave an impression with them. And that's about all you can accomplish in the time frame you've got. You've typically got about 20 minutes, maybe an hour at the most. Maybe it's just an elevator pitch to convey to the person with a check on the other side of the table why they need to pass that check over to you. In 20 minutes, 40 minutes, you're never going to be able to get through all that stuff on the left. But if you can leave them with an impression, if they can walk out of that room and say, yeah, you know, that person presented to me and what I got of that was something that makes me think I should go back and check out their website. I should read the business plan that they left on my desk. I should go back and have a second meeting with them. That's about all you can accomplish when it comes down to a 20 minute meeting. So don't try to accomplish more than that. You're wasting your time if you try to accomplish more than that. So stick with your objective. Your goal of a PowerPoint presentation is to leave an impression. And I would argue try to lean towards the general versus the specific. Okay? Don't drown people in the detail. So if you're keeping uh, track at home, this is tip number one. There's only four tips today, four lessons to remember. Tip number one, don't drown in the detail. Keep it general, leave an impression. Make sure they remember you versus making sure they remember everything about you. So what is a presentation? If you do have a presentation with a fund manager or a VC or an angel and you know, they've, got, uh, they've decided to give you an hour, you're going to get in there, you're going to talk for five minutes about how the weather is. Uh, you're going to have to get out of there to get to your next meeting. So you've really got about 45 minutes to present. And in that 45 minutes, boom, you've got to go get through all that stuff. Eight products. You've got the business plan. You've got all these accounts. You've got awards that you've won. Uh, you've got a growth strategy that you want to talk about. You've got a great boardroom that you just renovated. You want to show them how that looks. Uh, you've got some great coverage in the Globe and Mail you never expected. You'd like to show them what that coverage looked like and all the other coverage you're working at generated. You've got a great new website you just launched. You want to make sure they see that so you can show them you did that. Um, you know, you've got a code, a code a vision, values, a mission statement. You want to walk them through all that. 45 minutes. And it's not 45 minutes. I lied about that. It's actually 10 minutes. And it's 10 minutes twice, maybe four times. And that's about all you've got. And why do I say 10 minutes? And that's probably people in this room can tell that answer that question a lot better than I can. But you know, we spend a lot of time thinking about the audience and what they're capable of absorbing. In my world, uh, I'm typically taking public companies around who are looking to raise anywhere between 10 to 100 million dollars, five to 100 million dollars. They're going out to present if they're in Canada. And in the US, it's a little bit different. Very sophisticated life science people there who will go into depth and want to know. But when you're starting off with, I would argue, the angel money, you, you know, you're looking locally. When you're looking for VC money, you're typically lo looking locally first. And if you're a, a public company in Canada, you're also going to be going after Canadian money. People in Canada typically look at, uh, in a day of taking six meetings, five out of the six, 29 out of the 30 that week are going to be mining or oil and gas, right? So they're thinking about rocks, they're thinking about oil, they're thinking about uh, cyclical nature of those things, the margins, how they're trending and all that. They're not thinking about, you know, wow, wouldn't it be great if, uh, you know, if this thing had a disulfide bond in it, it might be a little bit more, uh, a little less uh, degradable and might last longer and be a better product. Um, they're not thinking that way. And so that, that brain that they've got as well uh, only gets so much oxygen and so much sugar every day, and it's, uh, it's, that's a limited supply that it gets, and you're competing for that oxygen and that sugar supply when you go in and present. Um, I don't have the reference for me, but uh, for you, but from what I understand, it's typically about 10 minutes 
before you shut down. I don't know how long I've been going for now, but if we're hitting about the 10-minute mark, some of you are starting to look at your watch and think, hmm, you know, whatever you typically get distracted with at about the 10-minute mark, you're, you're thinking it now. And really, the only way you can get people re-engaged and back into another 10-minute cycle, uh, some of the tricks are to emotional things really help, uh, personal things. So often, it's, it's a good chance to go back into a personal story at the 10-minute mark uh, tell them something about yourself or put up an interesting picture, something that just breaks them out of the box to get them back. But the point being, you don't have a lot of time with these people. And even if you do have 45 minutes with them, it's probably not a real 45 minutes. It's a, it's a 45 minutes you're time sharing with uh, about 100 other different thoughts in their head. Realistically, if you've got about 45 minutes, um, and I'm completely breaking the rule today, I think I've got about 97 slides or something, so we'll see how we do. But a good rule of thumb, uh, about a minute per slide is about what you can accomplish. So if you're going in for a 45 minute presentation, I would suggest 20 to 30 slides. I wouldn't try to do more than that. If you're getting over 30 slides, you're probably introducing a lot of noise into your talk that no one's gonna benefit from. And you're actually, once you're going over 30 slides, you're, you're actually making things worse because now they're not gonna remember you at all. They're thinking about their cottage, they're tired, and you've completely ruined the meeting 100%. Keep it to 20 slides and you've got a shot at being remembered. Um, the other thing is you want dialogue. You don't want to just have this be a one-way presentation. And I encourage you guys today as well, don't just save all your questions for the end of this. Ask me questions. Get engaged here. Because if we get engaged, and if you get engaged with the people that you're trying to raise money from, you have a much better chance of actually succeeding in that. Because a lot of what they're looking for isn't necessarily the ideas that are on the paper. They want to make sure that you give them that impression that they know that you have the DNA in you to actually execute on that, that you can be successful. And so getting a rapport and getting Q&A going is one of the ways to achieve that. If you use up 45 minutes with 45 slides, you're blocking that opportunity out. So keep about half your time to presenting and half for discussion. It's not a marathon, right? People, and I've got people who are you know, clients that are expert presenters but still come in and think, you know, we're getting through this, sit down, 45 minutes, we're gonna get through this thing, and then I'm getting out of here, right? And, uh, and it's, it's no fun for anybody. This is, this is more of a sprint. This is getting a few key ideas out so that you can have a good di dialogue around those key ideas. You go too far and you're not gonna accomplish anything. It's just gonna all get muddled. The other thing you want to do is, I call these, uh, and other people call them aha moments, but you want, to, you want a rapid transfer of knowledge. You also want them to maybe draw some of the conclusions. You don't want to necessarily spell everything out for them. They're smart people. They might not be PhDs in, in, in life sciences, but they're smart in their own right. You know, a, lot of, a lot of the people I meet on the, you know, on the capital market side, uh, they don't come across with sort of that academic kind of intelligence that you think, oh, you know, this guy's like, you know, he's going to ask me every hard question. They're, they're more folksy a lot of times, they're laid back. That doesn't mean that they're not, you know, sharp as sharp can be, right? They're, they're probing, they're thinking, and, uh, and you have to really get that information across them. But they're not thinking about what you're thinking about, so you have to make it simple for them to get your ideas across into the language that they can be prepared to, to focus on. Get to that aha moment as quickly as possible. So that, that's sort of the tip number one. Keep it focused. Don't drown in detail. Here's sort of a second concept I want to get across. Not all points are created equal. So this goes back to you get that Mac, you open it up, there's a PowerPoint presentation in there. You go ahead and you start making a PowerPoint. It's easy. You put a title and you put seven bullet points there. Right? And uh, so what, you know, what do you get out of, the, out of this, uh, this slide here? Is there anything on this? You know, is there anything on the slide that you really want that fund manager to know before they walk out of the room? And are you giving them any help at all in getting there, right? I mean, I would argue to you that point number three here is probably the one you want to make sure they walk away thinking about, right? And so, you know, this isn't, uh, this, is, this is kind of where I'll sort of pull back the veil. There's not, at Equicom, there's not some big, you know, uh, thought-leading team here that's, 
you know, working uh, with Cray computers to figure out the next way to do PowerPoint. This is pretty basic, basic stuff. Uh, and the reason why we have to go out and, and give talks like this and sort of get, you know, kind of pitch some of our ideas about PowerPoint is because even though these are basic, people don't do them. Um, so when it comes to making your point, a simple bit of landscaping on a PowerPoint could go a long way. You know, our brain is designed for the eye to kind of pop around, jump from place to place. It's not designed to be an eyeball that's riveted on a rail that goes well on one line, goes down the next line, goes down the next line, right? We like to jump around. We like, to, we like pattern recognition, looking at people's faces, looking at their eyes, lips, looking around. The point, go to the big point, some additional support. That's one way of doing it. Maybe the point, the big supporting point, a few little extra things, and then some message at the bottom that you really think they need to know before you leave that slide, right? One point per slide with some supporting and a message. Maybe it's the point and three ways that that point can uh, manifest itself, or three ways you can execute on that point, or, you know, and the underlying message about why that's important. You know, three ways that you can move forward on your point. The point is, <laughs> tip number two, grid it to great. And, uh, you know, if that helps you remember it, grids are, are you know, if there's a, it's, we don't have a patent on it, but if there's a simple thing that we do that people go, wow, you know, how'd you come up with that? It ain't rocket science. It's putting things into grids versus six, seven bullet points in a row. Think about what's the thing that you want to emphasize. Think about balancing scale. Think about what should be your priority. So another tip here, a lot of people when they uh, think about PowerPoint, think about that software program, they, uh, they assume PowerPoint is, uh, is sort of like flashcards. It's a bunch of flashcards that you have to get through, talk about this, talk about the next flashcard, talk about the next flashcard. I think if you're, if you're going to get in the mindset of how to do PowerPoint effectively, uh, think of PowerPoint as being a billboard. So you're going down the highway, you know, going down the Gardner Expressway. You, you still get a lot of those billboards because people are paying a lot of money to put them up there. They must be valuable uh, for advertising. There must be a great impact that they have on, on showing value to the people that pay for them. Uh, but they don't say a lot. They say very little. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a great approach for when you're building your PowerPoints. Huge impact without saying a lot. Um, sort of tip number three that kind of plays into, into that billboard idea is don't be hung up on words so much. Um, there are a lot of other things that work in a PowerPoint. Maps, pictures, diagrams, illustrations. I haven't used a lot of words today. Um, can anyone tell me what this is? The letter G. So it's the letter G. It, uh, the reason you probably know that that's the letter G is not because you were born with you know, a set of instructions saying, whenever you see that, that's the letter G, right? What you know is that that is a picture of something. And you've seen that picture enough times to know that that's not a picture of my face or a picture of Tony's face, that's a picture of a letter. And then another part of your brain is gonna go, that's a letter that sounds like G, which can be used in like my son's name, Gladstone, and uh, has a lot of importance to me. But that's, that's about it. It's, 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 uh, letters are just pictures that are very small, <laughs> very hard to see, and, uh, and we throw a lot of them on a page, so there's a lot of computational work in our head to try to analyze all those pictures, make sense of them all as far as what those pictures means. Okay, we process them, they're words. Okay, they're words. We process them, they're sentences. Okay, now they're sentences. What do they mean to me? Are they important? Do I need to remember it? All those steps you're adding in, right? Um, you can accomplish a lot with a picture that you, you, you know, that you may not need to do with words. And if you are going to go with words, you can accomplish a lot with very powerful statements without getting into, you know, gum is important because it can be chewed. And when you chew it, it gives you pleasure in your mouth as you move your teeth back and forth. It gives you exercise of your jaw. And, you know, just some 
straight points that impact us all. And we all know these resonate. You're reading this and you know that this transfers to you quickly. And this is what you have to achieve when you're pitching. So again, the right information, high quality information is what you want to focus on. And that generates long lasting, defined, profitable relationships, right? What is a presentation? Again, you know, we're saying it's about 20 to 30 slides. Um, but, you know, tip number three you should take home today, it's not about 20 to 30 slides. Um, so again, let's, let's look at this picture here. And we'll do another bit of audience interaction. Maybe we're at another 10 minute mark here so we can get everyone uh, revived. Um, so here's a picture. And if I could ask in the audience, anyone who um, English is not their first language to put up your hand. Okay. And is there anyone here who has not, keep your hands up, sorry, if you're, um, and is there anyone here who hasn't had contact with children, say, in the last 10 years? Nobody? Any, okay. Uh, in the last, is, is anyone else with their hand up? I've got one person. Anyone without contact in the last uh, 15 years, 20 years? Who's the longest without children contact? <laughs> Let's just ask you. Okay, so this picture, you, English isn't your first language, right? And English is not your first language. Oh, I want something. English is not your first language. Oh, okay. Well, so <laughs> let's, let's go through this process again. Anyone who English is not your first language and hasn't had contact with children in a reasonable amount of time, put up your hand. Okay. This story here, can you tell me what this is about? It's a story about the pig. And what, are, what, what did the pigs do? Uh, the pigs were hiding in their house. In their three separate houses. Was there any other characters involved in the story? What I recall there were was a wolf. Uh -huh. And what was the wolf uh, trying to do? The wolf was trying to get to the pig. Okay. And do you remember what is sort of, what would he say when he was going to get the pigs? Do you know? Any? Okay. And do you, any idea when the last time you may have heard that story? Have you heard that story before? Or? 20 years ago, okay. So, so, so an image of three pigs could mean a lot of things. But I think everyone in this room knows exactly what the three pig image is. And, and here's someone who hasn't heard the story in 20 years. English isn't their first language. I, I mean, maybe this is a story that's spoken a lot of languages. Maybe even this English wasn't the first language for the story. I'm not sure. But uh, the point being that, you know, so much information transferred with so little, with no words, no words, and essentially a picture of three pigs, right? And that's the power of, of, uh, of, that, of, of communicating with that approach, what you can achieve. Um, so a lot of people ask which came first, the chicken or the egg? And uh, that's a question that no one seems to have answered quite yet. But I can tell you, in my business, there's definitely one that comes first. And you can't sell somebody a solution until you sell them the problem, right? So that, that, that's pretty critical to the way we at least do things in, in, in my company and, and when we communicate. You have to explain first what the hunger is. Without the hunger, there's no plot. Um, you know, we don't, when we see Star Wars, Right? If you think back to the, the first Star Wars movie, which is the fourth Star Wars movie, but um, you don't see first, who's, who's the first person you see in, in that movie, right? You see Darth Vader. You see this terrible thing going on, this ship's being attacked, and this dude walks in, you know, I think I was like eight years old at the time, and it's evil Darth Vader, and he's coming and, you know, taking over and, and hurting people, right? And then, and then not till maybe 20 minutes into the film, Along comes a young Luke Skywalker who's going to be saving the day, right? And that's key. You know, narrative to tell a story, first you tell the hunger, and then you tell who's coming to solve that hunger problem, right? So I'll give you some examples now. Um, in, our, in our business, we do a lot of PowerPoints, and we take them to a level that I don't expect 
anyone here would or would need to take. But when you want to kind of see some of the stuff I've talked about sort of manifesting itself in what we do, uh, the slides that we open up for our clients often have to hit this hunger message really quickly, right? So, you know, how is that hamburger? Well, <laughs> you know, you're still feeling so hungry, right? You know. you know, so E. coli is a big problem. And for, for a company like Thalion who has a solution for this, um, if you start off your, your uh, presentation by saying, I've got a wonderful solution for E. coli, and you go around and, and pitch that, if that's your elevator pitch, no one cares. But if you say to people, did you know that there is a situation going on where more than 300,000 people uh, you know, get whacked by E. coli, and it, it, could be, uh, it can end up ultimately in death for some of them, and there's no answer for that except, by the way, what we've invented, which is a solution for this. Which one gets you more passionate? Which one gets your attention and gets you thinking, maybe I could make some money off of this, right? You know, the underlying value proposition of uh, Conjuchem was uh, they could take a native peptide, which would degrade in minutes in the body, and by conjugating it to a larger molecule, uh, like albumin, they could take that uh, short-lived peptide and make it last for up to a week at a time in some cases. Um, you know, the heart has all kinds of issues, all these different ways of treating the heart, uh, using heat, damage the heart ultimately. So, you know, that's a problem. Coronary disease is a huge problem. 20% of all deaths are by coronary disease. You know, you got to put that down on the table first before you go walking in and telling people how you're going to have a solution for coronary disease. You know, arterial, uh, atrial fibrillation, right? Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know what AF is, uh, especially if you're in the mining and gas space. But, uh, you know, it's going to affect a lot of people, one in four, right? So suddenly, if you're a fund manager and I tell you, and maybe there's a panel of four people you're meeting with, I can say one in four of you are going to get this. Now it matters. Um, you know, peptides matter. Right? Uh, proteins matter. Why, why should a business form itself on uh, servicing the protein industry? Well, because one third of all new products are, are proteins. This was for uh, therapy. So, and this is important uh, sort of as the next concept, but kind of ties into this one. When you, when you talk about, when you've now explained what your hunger is and how, what your solution is to hunger, people get confused between value and value proposition. Right? So, I, you know, you have people that, uh, you know, I've had people come into my office, uh, uh, co-workers, people I'm managing, and, uh, you know, they might say, well, I'm really frustrated because I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, and no one recognized that I did that. You know, I deserve a raise for that, right? I should have done that. And that, you know, that works in that, in that scenario, right? But when you're going to ask people for money who you've met for the first time and they don't have any vested interest in anything you've done to date uh, and you go in and you say I got fast track approval, I've got manufacturing, I've proven this, I've got this done, uh, I should be worth way more than I am, right? That doesn't fly because it doesn't fly because, not because you, that, might, that might not be incorrect, that might be correct, uh, you may be worth more than you're being credited for today based on what your idea is worth or what you've accomplished so far with your idea. But, and, that, and it's important to establish all that stuff, but the reason why someone is going to give you money today isn't because you did something yesterday. The only reason someone is going to give you money today is because you're going to accomplish something tomorrow which is going to make you worth more. And when you do that, they'll be able to get $2 back instead of $1 or hopefully $10 back instead of $1. So a lot of people get hung up when they give the pitch of wasting a lot of the energy into trying to get credit for the value they've created. Don't present that noise into your pitch, in, or don't, at least don't overdo it, because you're wasting time. Tell them what you're going to do and why what you are going to do is going to be valuable, and they will see a return on that. 
Um, so I sort of described sort of, the, sort of the overarching ideas. You need to present uh, the hunger and then the solution to hunger, your solution to hunger. The other thing you need to do, and this is in particular to the tech and the life science based uh, companies, the, the innovative companies, you need your evidence behind them, right? So it's, it's presenting, you know, this, this drug uh, we believe is going to have a huge impact in, in the treatment of lung cancer. Uh, and that can be your slide, and that's how you're going to, you know, it's an antibody and it targets this receptor. It's going to go in, it's going to be great in lung cancer, right? And that, that might be the value proposition, and, and that gets them excited to invest. But these people also want evidence. And so you have to back up everything you say. And in, in, in the world of, of raising money around technical stories, evidence is critical. So when you start to first lay out your concepts, include slides that follow on that really draw out some of that data, right? So when we make claims around the hunger, when we, when we make claims around cancer is a problem, we don't just say cancer is a problem, we back it up with some data, some hard data that people can get their heads around. When we say that, uh, you know, drugs that uh, work on cholesterol lowering are, are a huge market, we don't just say that, we back that up with evidence that allows those money people to, to get their heads around things that they're comfortable around with, which is the evidence of those markets. Um, when we're talking to clinical people, it's not just the drug works, it's not just it met the primary endpoint or it had good proof of concept data. Show some evidence behind it, right? This is what it does and show maybe a comparison. How does it do compared to the standard of care or compared to competing products, right? Uh, and all along the way, you can see how we're using our sort of a gridding philosophies here for, for presenting this information, right? So, you know, healthcare ramifications of risk. There's lots of different factors, four different factors we think are all equally important to that point. But the take home message on this is that there's no practical solution, right? So, you know, we're gridding this up to get that information across. You know, the incidence of diabetes is going to get worse and the demand for insulin is going to get correspondingly worse, right? We want to get that point across that if you're investing in a business in the diabetes space, specifically someone who produces insulin, here's the evidence, here's your evidence that that market is growing and uh, it's a good space to be in, right? Uh, you know, and it's not just going to end there for insulin. We're getting into... Uh, um, you know, inhaled insulin, other types of insulin that use a lot more of the, uh, of the, of the main ingredient to deliver the effective dose. So the amount of insulin is going to go up even higher. So that's an even more important reason why you should be excited about this company that's, in, that's going to produce insulin. Right. And then as Michael Denny, and I don't know if anyone knows Michael Denny, I'm sure Tony probably talked to him many times, but he, uh, he was sort of the, one of the patron saints of, of my company, of Equicom. Uh, he was one of the uh, leading healthcare bankers in the late 90s, early 2000s on the healthcare side, did a lot of these you know, 50, 180 million dollar IPOs and was also uh, then went on to clean tech over the last five years in China and has been really spearheading a lot of client China and, and clean tech initiatives. But uh, he was great for Equicom. You know, when we started, we were pretty young to the business, and we've learned a lot as we've gone and honed what we've done. He told us pretty much on day one, you have to show investors the 10-bagger. If you can't show an investor how they're going to make 10 times their money, um, they're probably not going to invest in you. And it's not necessarily, and that might sound greedy or it might sound, you know, that, that's a bit extreme, but there's probably another story out there that is showing how they can do a 10-bagger. So if, if you're competing against that, it doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong, he can take his money to somebody else who, who is going to meet that, that requirement. So when you're thinking about your stories, think about how, how can you achieve that 10-bagger. They're not all 10-baggers. They're two, three-baggers, you know, depending on your cost of capital, your expenses and all that. They don't have to be 10-baggers. But I think for the, you know, for the right the big companies that we need to have in Ontario that employ lots of people, that drive the industry forward, they're typically 10 bagger stories. So these are some of the examples of getting 10 bagger slides 
across to people, right? The current market for our drug would have been $140 million, but you know, that's only if we can get into these types of graft versus host diseases, right? If we can branch into a paradigm shifting market of using our technology to deal with autoimmune diseases and blood disorders and all that, we go from a little $140 million market that you know, is very credible. We've shown you a lot of evidence that we can achieve that market. And we've sold you today on give us money today to go after that market. But by the way, investor, when we succeed on that and we've all made money, we're going after that and you're going to want to stay with us. And this is the real reason to be in it. Because if we're just going for that, well, you know, you could probably get your money from somewhere else, from somebody who's not as ambitious as, as I am with my money, right? Same example, right? You know, here's a product that uh, initially we're tar targeting some of these cancers, but we think that uh, there's a paradigm shift in the market where if we can branch into the right side of the market, we go from uh, being a small, maybe a billion dollar opportunity to being multiple billions. You know, in the IT space, their complexity is one, our $1 billion market. 54 million people who need their cholesterol addressed. You know, one farm producing all the insulin for the world was their value proposition, right? Not six bullet points to explain how one farm can produce all the insulin for the world. And if I ask you to now, and I will remember this slide tonight, I'm sure when you go home, you can close your eyes and you will be able to visualize that slide. Uh, but you won't be able to visualize any tech slides you've seen today. So remember, high quality evidence all the way through. Um, again, gritting to great, getting across everything you have, but not with a lot of messages. Arius here. Their value proposition was they could generate a, a pipeline of endless candidates. 400 antibodies could, had already been produced out of their engine. Five partnerships had been driven off of that uh, engine of antibodies. And from those partnerships, uh, and in addition to those five partnerships, those five partnerships took a bunch of the antibodies out of the 400. We took three antibodies out of the 400 that we were developing internally all for ourselves. The company got acquired for 190 million. Point is, that was pretty much the only slide you had to present to anybody, right? Antibodies are huge. It was sort of an, you know, if you want to do the hunger slide, everyone wants antibodies. Companies are buying antibodies, companies like crazy. We are an antibody company with all the credibility of partnerships and internal products. You know, you don't need to show uh, ugly, terrible pictures of rats opened up and you know, and uh, you know, how tumors are shrunking. I, the, the people who uh, want to write you the check are perfectly happy to see a more subtle version of what you're trying to achieve. They still want to know that you're achieving results, but they're probably more concerned about the 25% number than the one-off anecdotal patient picture that you know, almost creates skepticism in their mind when they see that. It's the 25% over the larger group that actually matters to them but you won't forget that picture. Um, you know, details on the data. Again, gridding it up, this, I want to describe this uh, CRO. I, you know, six lines of text on what a CRO does, or grid it up so you can say, this is who we are. First thing you're gonna remember is we are the fastest growing, profit, we are a fast growing and profitable CRO. If you, you know, someone who's out in that hallway will get that message. You know, some at the back of the room will then move on and get those four messages, top 10, 400, 90, 8 out of 10. And then if you really care to read on, you can. But you've got some great information without having spent any time on that slide. Leading hospitals. Data. You're always wanting to present your data. Make sure, again, that's the credibility is your data. But remember, oil and gas and mining people that aren't going to necessarily know what that bar chart actually means. Here's another interpretation of another aspect of the data, which is the drug doesn't get in the blood-brain barrier, so you're not going to see the nausea and vomiting you do from the other GLP-1 candidates that aren't attached to an albumin and can get into the blood-brain barrier. 
I mean, just think of all the concepts you've learned in the last 20 minutes looking at some of these slides that, uh, you know, very little effort to communicate those ideas across. You know, when you're showing the progress of your trial and the data and, and what you're trying to do, this is kind of maybe specific to those of you advancing uh, uh, products in clinics or preclinical trials. You know, you want to convey sort of what what the uh, what you need to achieve to be successful, and that's hard for people to understand a lot of times. You know, they get the data, they see these press releases around the data, or you tell them the data, and nine times out of ten, I get phone calls later saying, "So is this good or bad? Is this a good press release or a bad press release?" You know, I don't even know if uh, how we did. So, what we really try to do is, when you're out there in those early meetings trying to get money from people, you want them to understand so that they're not disappointed a year later when you show them your data. You want to show them what would happen if you succeeded with your data. You know, if here this was actually more results, but we show you know, a 42% increase in survival. What does that actually translate into? It translates into 91 weeks. Yeah. 91 weeks to only add another drug onto the, the pipeline. That's something that a, you know, an investor can understand that that's not too prohibitive for, um, for the, uh, you know, for doctors to prescribe that extra drug in a in a protocol. It doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't seem like that would be too difficult. You can see there's not a lot of innovation going on from 1980 to 2004. All we did was surgery with radiation. 2005 we added one drug. You know, now we're 2010, and you know this seems to be the only way we can get our next incremental improvement. So a lot of information coming out of that slide. And these clinical design, clinical trial paths, I think, are sort of stepping out of the box of how to do effective pitching. But some of the, I just want to show you some of the slides we typically make to convey some of these critical paths in, in doing uh, clinical trials. Because a lot of people get confused as to when everything is going to happen and when I should be watching for events and things like that. So, you know. These are some of the numbers that matter to people, right? You know, when is enrollment starting? When is enrollment completing? Number of patients in the trials. You know, when do we have data lock? When can we expect that data, right? And then you've got a parallel trial down there. So we can sort of see, we can see as an investor now that, you know, the, the golden time for this company is, you know, between Q2 and Q2 of 2007 and H2 of 2007, we're going to find out about that phase two, and we're going to find out about that phase three. So if I'm an investor, right, I want to invest sometime probably in the first quarter of 2007 before those two data points come out. If you come back to me in 2005, and you're asking me for money in 2005, you're going to have a hard time. You've got to convince me that I've got to hang in there until that data comes in 2007, and I get one of those ups or downs that we showed in those first couple of slides. Uh, the closer you get to your data, the more likely I am to give you a dollar because I don't have to have that dollar sitting there doing nothing. It's actually probably growing. But, uh, but the challenge is, you know, by laying this out, you have a better shot at getting the people at the front end of the spectrum because at least you've laid a clear plan for them to see how you get to the end. And if, if they are going to invest there, maybe they won't see your stock price go up or any other kind of measurement, but they're going to see you tick off those boxes and that's going to make them comfortable. It brings me to another story, which I just saw this weekend. Um, and so another politically controversial one, but I don't really care about what, what, which way anyone leans or anything, but they were talking about the Cold War and sort of how the Cold War ended and, uh, you know, it was Ronald Reagan uh, driving up space and Star Wars defense initiative and, and uh, you know, causing sort of the USSR to have to spend more money on space and all that. And, and, and a really interesting point that came out in this, uh, in this documentary was, you know, the Russians, the USSR really had a lot, really, really believed in Ronald Reagan. They, I don't mean believe like inspired with him, but believed he had a lot of credibility. They believed that when he said he was going to do something, he was going to do it. And so probably what this documentary argued, and I, I don't see why to object, is that a, a lot of the progress that was made was because there was so much credibility around when he spoke that he would probably actually do some of the things he said he was going to do. That happened, that credibility was one,
because there was an air traffic controller strike. And when the air traffic controller strike happened in the US, uh, Ronald Reagan got up and he said, if, you know, if something doesn't happen in the next few days, few hours, um, you know, then we're going to act decisively. And so he went and communicated, set the expectation that he was going to do something serious. He wasn't just going to sit back passively. And then a few days later, he fired all of them, right? That probably was pretty upsetting for those air traffic controllers and for people in the U.S. who were dealing with that. But it, the important thing is the impact it had in the USSR, where they saw something completely unrelated to what they're doing so dramatically impact the way they then dealt with him and, and the credibility that he created through that. So point being here is, you know, the things you do in the early days may not actually result in rewards or, or, or outcomes that your investors may value, but you will be gaining your credibility. So it's important to lay out very clear maps of where you're going and build that credibility as you go. So again, some examples of sort of how we do it when we try to flash it up a bit, but you know. So kind of a summary slide of, of sort of the, uh, the telling the story idea. We, you know, if you were gonna take sort of three messages home, I know I've sort of given you four tips. I haven't actually gotten to the fourth, but if we're gonna kind of recap the tips I gave you, don't drown in the details, right? Uh, it's not all words, right? It's not words. And uh, I knew I'd forget the third one. It was in my head a second ago, but grid it to great, right? Um, three other concepts I would say take home, uh, which we've talked about all through this. Number one is the right information, right? So make sure you have the right information. That doesn't mean everything. That doesn't mean telling them all 45 slides of everything you've done in the company. Picking the right information those investors need to know to make an effective investment decision, right? Distill those messages down. You need to transfer that information as rapidly as possible, right? Because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm pretty sure most of you want to be here. You've, you know, you've known about this event. You came to be here because um, you want to hopefully learn something. Uh, investor meetings where you're asking for money, they don't necessarily want to be there. And, uh, and so you're competing for every second of their attention. I went to a meeting uh, two weeks ago. The guy was 25 minutes late and uh, walked in. Uh, spent five minutes in the room and he said, uh, you know, I don't invest in early stage stuff anyways and walked out. And that was our meeting. And, uh, you know, that was, that was incredibly frustrating. I don't really know how we would have kind of avoided that one differently, but certainly, you know, that just goes to show how these things go, how little time you can have to capture, uh, ha capture them. So you have to transfer that information rapidly and that goes sort of to those three points, grid it up, use pictures, don't drown details. And then with high recall, right? So imagery, brevity, stories, impact, emotion, that's the things that make you uh, remember stories. Right? So just some clothing thoughts on uh, sort of wrapping it up. Uh, a lot of people ask me, uh, and Mike and, and people in our group, what, uh, what about presentation training, right? You've, You've talked about giving a PowerPoint and sort of some of the things that I should go on my computer and work on and lay out. But, you know, I have to get up in front of everybody and, and give that talk. And how should I do it? Should I have my hands in my pockets? Should I, you know, have my arms crossed? Should I walk around the room and wave? Should I walk in the audience and talk to people? What's the right way to present? And I think the answer to that is I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, what I've found uh, is most effective is to just be authentic. You know, again, the, 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 the goal of this, at least, you know, this talk today was an effective pitch. You're trying to get money from people. No one likes to give money to someone they don't trust or that they feel is trying to be slick or just, you know, is a little too smart, a little too cool, whatever it is. And, you know, if you've you know, some of the, the books, the Malcolm Gladwell books are, you know, are, are popular today. They cover a lot of that kind of topic area where, you know, you've got a fund manager, you've got someone with money looking at 30 stories a week, hundreds of stories a year. That neural network that they've developed is an uh, extremely highly sensitive BS detector, right? And so there's nothing you can do except be yourself because anything else you do is just going to fail. 
Um, so for me, I'm not someone who gets up and jumps around and walks around. I tend to be fairly low key, but I, you know, I try to try to make it uh, slightly uh, interesting if I can. But that, that's that's this is what I'm like, and this is how I present. I've you know people uh, some people come in and they tell jokes for half an hour, and uh, you know I, I caution them that they've wasted a lot of valuable time that they could have transferred information across. But it is them, and it does. They've had some incredible results with the relationships they've had because they are authentic in the way they are. So you know, I do, I do believe you. You know, you put on a good suit if you're, you know, if you're going for a job interview, you take it seriously. If you're going to raise money, it's more serious than a job interview. You're probably raising money for more than your life. You're raising it for maybe employees as well. Um, so you've got to take that extremely seriously. You know, get some new shoes, go buy a suit. Uh, spend a little money. There's nothing wrong with doing that kind of thing, but it's just don't think that that's the solution. I mean, uh, an effective presenter can present however they're dressed and and uh, and however they, you know, as long as they're authentic, right? Speak like a person. The other way to uh, present effectively with comfort, and it's that old joke, you know, how a man's walking down the street, he's uh, looking for uh, Carnegie Hall sees someone in the corner, says, excuse me, how can I get to Carnegie Hall? The guy says, practice, practice, practice. And that's, you know, that's what you have to do, right? So, you know, I, I've given this talk a number of times uh, in the last two years. I watched uh, Mike give this talk uh, about three weeks ago at Biofinance. Um, it doesn't mean I didn't spend probably from 2 o'clock on today um, thinking, you know, in, in, in addition to laying out slides over the last couple of weeks, but you know, I spent from two o'clock today thinking about what do I want to say? You know, are there stories I can tell? Anything I can say to kind of wake people up a bit, and, and so on. So, the more you practice, the more comfortable you are. The more comfortable you are, the more authentic you are. The better your story is going to come across. Okay. Again, I could have done this all in one slide, and that slide is: tell them what the problem is, tell them what the hunger is. Tell them how you solve the hunger with your value proposition and tell them how, you, how they are going to make, how you and them are going to make money when you solve hunger with your problem to satisfy the greed. If you're looking for some of the, some of the books that we read sort of in the office to look at uh, getting some ideas, so there's uh, Made to Stick, uh, Presenting to Win, Slideology, it's a good one. Uh, brain rules talks more about that biochemical side of the brain, and you know, 10 minutes of sugar, things like that. Um, there's SlideShare, which is a website uh, where we at Equicom post a lot of our PowerPoint presentations. So, if you want to see kind of fuller versions of some of those things, go to SlideShare, type in Equicom, and you'll probably get I don't know how many on there now, but there's quite a few. Uh, and uh, What's another one? Uh, YouTube. YouTube is becoming a great way to, uh, to do everything, but to, to see PowerPoints as well. And I'd suggest, uh, you know, in, in reverse, when you have stuff, don't just put it on your website or don't just have it. Post it on YouTube. Post it on SlideShare. Uh, if you've got a Twitter account, then Twitter back to where it is on YouTube and start to get that growth that way. So I know, like, you know, I've said all this and uh, sort of our experience has shown that 99% of you will forget this. <laughs> and next time you're, uh, you're called on to make a presentation, uh, you're more likely to follow the night before scramble, shuffle some slides together. Um, you know, a good 50% of my CEOs, uh, at least the ones that are in the early stages before we have time to really break it out of them. Uh, you know, they're still making PowerPoints on the flight to the conference they're going to. And you, you know, every time I get on a business flight and you see in the business section, there's people out with their laptops scrambling to get their PowerPoints ready. It's just not the way to do it. And if you go with a less is more approach, uh, I think you'll find you have a set of, power, of slides that are always available in that less is more approach. You don't need to tweak it every day add the next new thing. You know, another uh, phenomenon we get with our CEOs is this desire. You present your story 30 times in a row. For some reason, you think that you're presenting it to the same person, even though you're presenting it to 30 different people that week. But your brain says, I'm presenting this story over and over. 
everyone is sick of it because my brain is really sick of it. But so then the next thing you do is you start to change your story. You start to add. You know, maybe we're not going to do 100%. Actually, we're going to do 110%. Um, you know, and, and by the way, this is I. I'm going to add this. You know, I was flying home from Denver, and that last guy asked me a question that, that really bothered me. So I'm going to make a whole new slide that speaks to that, right? And next thing you know, you've got the kitchen sink, and you're presenting 80 slides of garbage again, full of noise, with no hope of the person who met with you ever remembering any of it because you've stacked too much in their head and they've dropped all the balls rather than juggle the three that they should have received. So uh, please don't fall back in the trap. Try to do some of this stuff. Gritting to great, so easy to do. Doesn't have to be every slide. Pick two or three slides, grid them up. You'll see there's an impact right off the bat. Cut words out. Ask yourself when you look at a sentence, does this eight word sentence need to be eight words? Or are there two, two words that can do it? Does it need to be a multi-syllable Latin-based word, or can it be an Anglo-Saxon grunt that you know, typically tends to have more emotion, right? You know, the ultimate versus the best. You know, best hits it. And then my fourth tip, tip number four, is this does take a lot of hard work, you know? I mean, it seems like hard work when you're scrambling to throw your PowerPoint together on a business class flight and you're wedged between two people. That seems like hard work. But that's, that's unfortunate hard work. Hard work is you know, staying up late at night like you all do, but staying up late at night to do this. Focus on honing that PowerPoint, you know? And uh, bring that entrepreneurial spirit to your PowerPoints. And remember all along the way, you need that money. If you don't get that money, it doesn't matter what you do. But if you get that money and if you get a lot of it, you can accomplish some pretty big things. And if you achieve something, then you're able to get the next round of money. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So happy to answer any questions. I know uh, I encourage everyone to use the mics because I know this has been uh, archived or retransmitted. Hi, thanks uh, very much for such an insightful and uh, really interesting and entertaining uh, presentation. I think it shows us sort of how to keep on plowing through this 10 minutes. <laughs> thanks for embodying that. Thank um, you. How, I presume we have a room full of people that are very passionate about what we do. So, you know, to us, when we're attempting to distill these ideas into something that's, that's, that's very sort of, um, uh, you know, compact and, and understandable, what would, advice could you give um, really on the basis of how, how do we go through the process of distillation? How do we make through the noise and really get to the signal? Yeah, I mean, you know, you see kind of different methods. I mean, you can pick up textbooks on PowerPoint and they talk about different methods, which are... Um, you know, I think there's valid validity to a lot of them. Basically, it, you know, hoppers or bubbles, I've heard them called. But, you know, if you're going to work with 20 slides, and I'd recommend 20 to 30 slides, you probably only have enough room for maybe five, five sort of mini areas within that. So I tend to, you know, when I sit down and do a PowerPoint, I tend to write five bubbles, we call them, five circles. and I kind of say to myself, what's the first circle? Well, the first circle typically is that, that need expressed, that hunger. So I want to you know, make, make a hopper of things that fit into the hunger basket there. And then how do we address that hunger? So what's our, what's our solution? And then typically from there, and, you know, and going back, and the hunger one, you know, your, your first slide is maybe, what is the hunger? And then you've got to always back things up with evidence. So, Hunger, evidence. Next one is solution, evidence, that the solution works, right? And then, then, you know, then there's some variability after that. You may want to do a section on, uh, you know, you've, you've, you've sat, if there's hunger and you satisfied the hunger. How are we actually going to get to the point where we can roll that product out? So maybe it's the development challenge of it, right? Or maybe it's, uh, um, uh, you know, what are, what are some of the other ones? Um, you know, what, uh, what are the nuances of the regulatory process? You know, what are, what are some of the hurdles we have to overcome in there? There's probably a hopper after that, which is 
um, you know, sort of the next wave, where do we grow beyond the core idea? You can look at that. Um, and a hopper on, on just kind of the basic corporate facts. You know, there's this many employees, here's a board of directors, uh, here's our capital structure, and you know, how we're funded, how we expect to be funded. Mm -hmm. But you know, going back to those first three hoppers are really critical. So you gotta divide up into what do people really, really want out there? And, and, it's, and that's, that's a lot of work, right? It's not, you know, you, you answer a question and you say, like we, we had a company, um, there's a company out there that has a way of when they uh, open, do an open heart surgery, they can see a whole bunch of uh, the vessels in the heart the way you couldn't see before, right? So, you know, you might start off by saying, well, the need expressed is um, that uh, heart surgery, you know, there's a lot of heart surgeries going on, right? So we need solutions for heart surgeries. Well, that's, that's not answering it, right? But is it, but then it's, well, no, there's, you know, there's a real specific problem here, and the need is that when surgeons go and finish up this open heart surgery, they can't entirely be sure that they did everything right because it's really hard to see some of these little vessels, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's the true need expressed, is that they close that up without 100% confidence, right? It's a lack of confidence. Right? So we provide confidence by, you know, by being able to allow you to visualize that. What's that confidence worth? Let's talk about the markets. That confidence is worth, well, how, what, what does it cost when you have to go back for a second heart surgery? Or when that patient dies, or complications, right? So that's the market. So that's so the A, B, C, the hunger, satisfy it, financial ramification. But if the work goes into drilling down, making sure you really know what your hunger is, right? It's, it's not always the first one you think it is. That might be a bigger hunger, but six of your competitors and four companies that have been doing that for the last 20 years might also be satisfying that perfectly well. It's why do you need to exist, you know, apart from everybody else. Hmm. Thanks very much. It's a lot of great food for, food for thought. Thank you. Thanks. Hi. Um, my question is that your slides focused on the opportunity and the idea or the product, and there wasn't anything I saw that uh, spoke to, say, the management team and the people that were behind it. Yeah. That yeah. is something that, from my perhaps limited experience, is something that um, BC investors are interested in. Do you have any suggestions on how you'd present that? Or, and would you include that? I mean, you just a moment ago mentioned you might include it in your sort of fifth bubble yeah. section. Well, I think there's two reasons. So um, there's a paradox here, right? When people do surveys of investors and they say, you know, what's the number one reason you chose to invest? It's management, right? It's, it's believing that management can execute the idea. So management is the most important thing. There is, so I don't argue with that, I agree with that. Um, and the, so two things, one is when it came down to here, I don't think how you communicate management, board of directors, or intellectual property necessarily has to be that innovative or flashy because it's pretty straightforward stuff. So I didn't think it lent itself well to saying these are the slides that you have to take up a notch. Okay. A management team can be a list of names, right? Um, but even there, I th but there's another uh, thing to, to consider here, and that's um, management, IP, board of directors, scientific advisory board are things that if you don't have those and they're not of a certain quality, you probably shouldn't be in the game in the first place, right? Like those are, those are so essential now that I, they're, they're cliche in a way when it comes to presenting to the more sophisticated investors. So you have to have those slides, but I really find, you know, presenting your, man I mean, you, people put up like a management team and a director team, like, okay, let me walk you through this. Here's, here's the president, he was this. Okay, here's the VP, he was this. We got this guy, he's our IT guy. We got him out of here and he's amazing. He did this and this, right? And you're, again, now they've forgotten the one thing you want to remember, which is you solve hunger. Right? So they will, they will get to know with the management team. The, what's critical with the management team is that the CEO presents so that no one else presents. You can't have you know, me presenting your company. I, you know, it's got to be the CEO. Uh, it can't be the communication person or you know, the person you think is the best presenter because they're dynamic or something. 
it should be the CEO. You know, they're the decision maker. And when you do that, when the CEO presents, then they get the DNA impression from that CEO. And again, it's that Malcolm Gladwell neural network, seeing a million of these people, you know, I don't need a slide with you walking me through these people to feel whether they're good or not. Where my neural network doesn't work is I don't know how to assess, you know, your, your, your biological idea here because mm -hmm. my neural network was never perfected for that. But my neural network is pretty adept at, at assessing people and whether they can deliver, whether they can be confident, execute, you know, I, that kind of thing. I agree with that. I was, it was, the question was more that there, it wasn't mentioned, I guess, in, in mm -hmm. a presentation, and I think it is important. So yeah. it is more self-explanatory, I guess. So. Yeah. Thank so you. That, that definitely critical to list their names and, and be proud of them. My question is, how effective is it to, I mean, yes, the visuals are important. Yes, distilling your message down in your PowerPoint is important. Do you have your clients leave the paper piece afterwards with a further discussion or like, like giving more details mm -hmm. to the people that, that you're meeting with? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's an interesting one too because I, uh, I just did a PowerPoint for someone today and they added three slides back in because they felt there was all this detail meeting missing. So, and then we looked at that and, uh, and then we took it back out. And the, you know, I think, I think the reason, you know, again, you don't want to drown people in, in detail. And uh, like, uh, I'm trying to think how I can answer that. It sounds like you really aren't in favor of, like, maybe going for another meeting if somebody wants more detail, but don't yeah. bother leaving the paper because they're not going to read it. Well, like the way that that conversation unfolded with, with that client was, you know, they said, but, you know, we're going to leave this behind. And when they look at our PowerPoint, they're not going to understand, you know, he, he had a bunch of text on sort of, it was, this title was Our Value Proposition. So we'd kind of done it in four slides, but then he wanted a text version of the Our Value Proposition after and, and my answer to that is two things. One is how many people in this room have a stack of stuff that never gets read and you're probably adding five things to it every day. And then God forbid you do the next thing, which I've managed to stop doing, which is you put it in your briefcase, take it home, bring it back, you know, it gets a walk every night. <laughs> but, um, but like it's, you know, I know that the PowerPoints that we drop off for these fund managers, we go and we present and they go in a stack, right? They don't get read again. And all you really want is that they remember you um, so that they might go onto your website or they might get a call from, uh, you know, if someone else who's saying, I'm thinking of that, and then you can, you know, the snowball flex starts to happen, right? Yeah, I saw them too. Well, you saw them, I remember them because I can remember them because they told me a really clear story and you saw them, so that's twigging my memories. So yeah, let's, let's, get, let's go look at that one a bit more. Let's go to the website, right? But, you know, maybe they might scribble some notes on the PowerPoint and go back. I've had a few analysts. Analysts, you know, they're the more uptight anal type of people. So when you go in, they'll probably pull the PowerPoint from the one you gave them four years ago with their notes and rehash what you said. But most people, it goes in a pile that never gets opened again. So uh, to me, it's Thank don't you. sacrifice the impact, your ability to make that strong impact, leave an impression. Don't risk putting that making that weaker by worrying about, oh, if I leave this behind and someone else reads it, it's not going to have that impact, right? Good afternoon. I, I really want to thank you. I've enjoyed uh, the presentation a lot. I'm intrigued. Um, for people who actually have to deal with uh, writing the details, kind of the appendix of things, mm -hmm. uh, would you actually recommend this approach to, to a report version? Because usually report versions are just uh, so such as a word, so uh, how do you actually add clarity with, with diagrams or, or is that kind of a lost cause and we have to leave it in no, text form? No, I think there's two, two comments there. I think one is that, you know, what, I, what I'm trying to talk about today isn't, I'm not saying every single kind of PowerPoint should be like this one. You know, you have to present, you know, to committees and to working groups and things like that. And, that's not this kind of PowerPoint, right? This is a PowerPoint when you're meeting with potentially a stranger or someone you don't meet very often and you need 
you need action to happen out of this, right? You need to get across something, someone who's, you know, you're completely new to them, both in the concepts and you and everything, and you've got to leave that lasting impression and force action that they'll call you back or that something could come of this, right? That's a lot different than a PowerPoint in a working group when you just want to go through, you know, all these ideas and documents to get through and, and make sure you understand. I do think between the two, there's a lot of room. I see, you know, a lot of audit groups, uh, you know, the auditors, the banks, uh, you know, I won't point any fingers at Mars, I, I can't, but, uh, you know, there's different, you know, different groups out there that pre present reports, and they present reports and don't avail themselves of a lot of the types of tools that are here, which again, you know, when you pick up an annual report, we do annual reports as well, when you pick up an annual report, I've never seen anyone pick up an annual report, but okay, annual report, all right, all right, no, like they pick up an annual report, oh, what's this, oh, yeah, good, yeah, well, okay, Let's see here, okay, oh, that, well, that's an interesting picture, right, so, like these reports that people write, there should be 10% of the time and effort put into distilling some information down for people so that, you know, this doesn't become another document that they say this is never going to get open. I'm putting this way down on that reading pile. It's not even making it in the briefcase because it's all text. Like, I have to, this is some of my holiday reading pile now, right? So... Whereas if you at least have some front end stuff that's more PowerPointy or at least more to this spirit of this kind of communication, I think people would pick it up. They'd get some, you know, they get the take home messages. They get an impression from it, and again, it would achieve sort of the same thing, which is I got a good impression from this. I'll take the time to read the following pages, right? So, I wish I wish people would do that more. We're just all so busy, right? I mean, it's getting worse and worse. I, it's, you know, everyone's got hundreds of emails, and you know, I, it's it's going to pervade everything. I find myself talking to my staff now and saying, you know, when you communicate in emails, especially because we're a client-focused business, right? You have to transfer information in your emails to your clients, and in the same philosophy, the right information rapidly with high recall, because you know, my my CEOs are out traveling North America, traveling Europe, going from airport to airport, looking through a BlackBerry, trying to decide what's effective and not effective and what's important and stuff. And people are sending them like, you know, four paragraphs with a PPS at the bottom. You know, no one even scrolls more than three lines down and you're, and the PPS is, and don't forget to do this or you're fired. <laughs> right? So, so it's, it's, you know, this is PowerPoint today, but it, it, but effective communication, we got to get a lot more efficient uh, in a lot of things. Right? Any other questions? So I, d I didn't bring any business cards uh, with me, but I know my, uh, I'm sure my contact information is available. And, um, we know like, where you live. We know where you live, so contact us. I'm happy to chat. If, you know, if someone's entrepreneurial enough to reach out to me, I'm happy to respond. And, uh, and we, we do these uh, talks, uh, you know, whenever we can. So if there's another opportunity, we're happy to do. Thank you very much. Thank you.